The Story Without a Name by Barbie de Orville, Chapter 7. In the midst of these ferocities, there came a moment when the mother, outraged indeed, but not yet wholly pitiless, stopped the torture she was inflicting on her child. It may be that she felt that, however the culpable the girl may be, she was going too far. It may be that she was touched at the sight of a face which had been delicious, but which now was what but a faded flower. Or again, it may have been a ruse on her part to surprise the secret which that fragile girl had the strength to keep hidden. Madame de Fragile knew what love is. She must love him madly, she decided, and she changed her tactics. The ferocity vanished. She became tender and motherly. Last to me, my child, she said one day, listen to me. You're killing yourself with grief, and you're killing me. You're damning your own soul, and you're damning mine. Concealment is falsehood, and in the humiliating comedy I play to hide your shame, I share that falsehood with you. A word from you would replace you, perhaps, in the arm of him who you love. Tell me his name. Perhaps he is not so low that you may marry him. Lastheny, my dear Lastheny, I am sorry that I have been so hard with you. I had not the right to do so. I have never told of myself. You, like everyone else, know but one thing of me, that I adored your father and eloped with him. But you do not know, nor does anyone else, that I, like you, my poor child, was culpable and weak. When I was married, I was in the same condition that you are. In the happiness of my marriage, the weakness was hid. I blushed at it, but to God alone. Your sin, perhaps, is the punishment and expiation of my own. God has terrible retaliations. I married your father. He was my divinity, but God is a jealous God. He will have no one preferred to him, and he punished me in taking my husband away and making me repeat what I did. Now why should you not marry the man you love? For you do love him, and if you do not adore him as I adored your father, you would not conceal his name. She stopped. The effort to say what she must have been immense, but she said it. She had not recoiled before the humiliation of admitting her parody to her daughter. It was her last remaining resource, the ultimate hope of earning the secret she burned to know. But the effort was futile. Lastheny remained unmoved. Broken in spirit, outworn by useless denials, she listened to her mother as she listened now to everything without answering a word. To her mother's reproaches, to her objurgations and anger, she became insensible as a corpse. The confession affected her as little as the abuse had done. Whether or not she remained silent because of her present inability to prove her innocence, who shall say? But one thing is certain, Madame de Fragile's sudden tenderness and appealing confession which she had made in the endeavor to obtain the girl's confidence by means of an avowal which placed them both on the same footing came too late. Besides, the girl's incomprehensible condition and the anguish of it had made her almost an idiot. For a long time, she had believed that something else was the matter with her. She remembered the torture inflicted on an unfortunate girl in the neighborhood who was thought to be an insight, and who remained, long after the natural time, in sight with a horrible tumor. Lastheny, and here's the tragedy of it all, Lastheny had hoped for a tumor as she hoped for God. It will be my revenge, she thought. But that hope she had lost. She could doubt no longer. The child had moved within her, and in moving it had awakened in her heart something which perhaps was maternal love. Won't you speak now, Lastheny? Madame de Fragil continued caressingly. Won't you speak to me as freely as I have spoken to you? You should not be afraid of a mother who has been as weak as you, who can save you, she added, in giving you to him who you love. But even physically, Lastheny did not seem to hear. She was deaf. She was dumb. Her mother watched her, ready to the inhale the answer that did not come. My little girl, do be good. Tell me who it is. Madame de Fragile took one of Lastheny's inert hands in her own and tried to draw her daughter to her. But that also must have come too late. They were sitting there in the embrasure of the mountains where they always sat. The girdling mountains that shadowed the house increased the dreariness of the room. And against the brown oak that covered the walls, Lastheny was as white as a plaster medallion. Madame de Fragile bent sadly over her needle, but Lastheny's work had fallen from her discouraged hands. She sat, upright, motionless as a statue, a statue of infinite desolation. Her lovely eyes, once so fresh and pure, were ruined by tears. There were red circles about them which made the burn of the 
tears had made and kept there, and the eyes themselves, which had begun to chafe as though it were blood that they had shed, expressed nothing, not even despair. Lastini was about to pass into something deeper than the extraction of a lunatic. She was falling into the vacancy of idiocy. With a pity into which terror mingled, the mother contemplated the disaster of her daughter's face. She had never told her she was pretty. The austerity of her creed prevented anything which might tend to exalt a personal pride, but at heart she had been glad for the girl's good looks. Now that her, her appearance broke her heart, she could see the hideousness of the idiocy forming it, a death in life. Many believe that the body dies before the soul takes flight, but there are instances in which the life remains long after the soul departs. Night overtook them where they sat. Come and pray God to unseal your heart and lips and give you the strength to speak, said Madame de Frigeol at last. Indifferent to God as to everything else, Lastinia remained seated. Madame de Frigeol was obliged to take her by the wrist, upon which automatically the girl yielded. Suddenly, the mother raised the girl's hand. What is this? she cried. Have you lost your father's ring, or do you think yourself no longer worthy to wear it? The misfortune that had overwhelmed these two women was so vast that neither of them had noticed that the ring was missing. Lastini, who had ceased to understand anything, looked at her hand and stretched her fingers as a lunatic might have done. Have I lost it? she murmured. She spoke as though she was issuing from a dream. Yes! answered Madame de Frigeol, whose eyes had become black again and implacable. Yes, it is as lost as you are. You gave it to him who you gave yourself. At once the tenderness vanished. The loss of her husband's ring seemed worse than the loss of her daughter's honor. That evening and the day after, Agatha searched for the ring everywhere. Lastini's hands had become so thin that it might easily have slipped from her unnoticed. But the ring was not found a fact which prevented Madame de Frigeol from again feeling the slightest compassion. From then on, she became frankly cruel. That evening, the church was neglected. Had they gone there, Madame de Frigeol would have taken with her the suspicion that had haunted her at intervals, a suspicion which, by reason of her daughter's invincible silence, held her like a vice. Since she would not tell her his name, she reflected, it is because she cannot marry him, and immediately the thought of that frightful capuchin whose name she would have not dared to utter to her daughter, nor even to herself, sprang at her. Even the letters of the name alarmed her, and so to assemble those letters and pronounce them in a whisper seemed to her a sacrilege. For it was a sacrilege to think ill of a priest who, while he dwelled at her side, had appeared irreproachable. That which made her tremble to think of, but of which she thought nevertheless might have seemed possible to another, yet never to her. "'Dear Lord,' she cried in her prayers, "'let it not be he.' "'Besides,' she reasoned with herself, "'when could this crime against God and her daughter have been committed?' "'He had never seen the, either of the two women in the absence of the other. "'He had turned his room into a cell, and save at mealtime never left it. "'It was absurd, therefore, to imagine what she did. "'And yet, in spite of all its evident absurdity, the suspicion which she banished as a suggestion from hell returned always and more infernally insistent than before. It possessed her, hallucinating her with terrifying visions and plunging her into silences as deep of those as Lasthenes. And yet, did she by any chance turn from the moment from the absorbing abstraction of which she vainly prayed to God to deliver her? At once there surged before her another vision, as powerful and imperious as the former, the vision of fleeting time. It was fleeting indeed, pitilessly even, and presently it would tell the entire hamlet of the shame of the ladies de Frigeol. There was but one thing left for them, to go away and disappear. Madame de Frigeol saw no one, but one morning, as Agatha was on her way to the market, she told her to say that all three were to return to Normandy. The prospect, not only of leaving the hole in which for nineteen years she had suffocated, but of again feasting her eyes on her native pasture lands, was the one thing calculated to make Agatha a little less unhappy. Lasthenes' condition, which she still believed the work of the demon, had made her wild with grief, the more so because she felt there could be no good remedy against it. But the good news cheered her a little. The change of air, Madame de Frigeol said, had become necessary to Lasthenes, and what air could be better than that of Normandy? These explanations, which covered the real one, Agatha neither discussed nor examined. 
She accepted them with joy and confidence. She was homesick for her native land, but from her, as from everyone else, Madame de Frigel wished to guard her daughter's secret. For that matter, it was her own as well. In her conscience, she felt that Lastenie's condition dishonored her as much as it did the child, and to conceal that dishonor, there was nothing of which she had not thought save an act which, in the present state of our miserable lives, might readily be called the crime of the 19th century. Madame de Frigil was too uptight, too religious to consider for a moment's space any of the forms of infanticide. Save that, Madame de Frigil had knocked against every angle of the terrible question. Plan after plan she made and relinquished. She thought of losing herself and her daughter in the immensity of Paris. She thought, too, of taking her to some foreign city. She was rich, and with money everything, even to appearances, may be saved. But what excuse had she for going off with a sick daughter, no one knew whither, and leaving behind an old and devoted servant, one who had accompanied her at the time of her scandalous elopement, and from whom, out of gratitude, she had then sworn never to part, happen what might. Besides, the adoption of such a plan would certainly have made Agatha suspect the shame of the girl whom all her life she had believed an angel of innocence and purity, and that Madame de Frigil wished to avoid at any cost. It was then that the idea occurred to her of returning to Normandy. After twenty years of absence, she felt that she must be entirely forgotten, that those to whom she had known in her youth had either died or departed. Then, too, the plan had another advantage. Agatha would be too occupied with her recovered home to discover the secret which was to die between her daughter and herself. The solitude to which she looked forward was of a different kind than that of which the hamlet offered. In Normandy, she would not live in either a city or a village, but in her own old Chateau de Londe, a castle situated in the corner of an unfrequented tract that lies between the Channel Coast and the peninsula of Cotonin. At that time, there was no highway there. The castle was protected by the wretchedness of the crossroads, and, during a part of the year, by the southwest winds which blew the rain upon it as on the home of some misanthrope, built behind inaccessible bypaths. It was there, like moles, that these two shames could hide. Madame de Frigil had resolved that even on the fatal day, no physician should be called. Her own hands would suffice, she told herself, and each time she did, a shiver caught her. And from the depths of her heroic and miserable voice cried, But afterwards, what of the child? Must you not hide it too as you hide the mother? Then, at once, she would begin again at the problem which strangled her like a noose, but there was no time to be lost. It was impossible to wait any longer. There was but one thing to be done, to get away from the hamlet which stared in her face, whereupon Madame de Frigil, with that feeling common to those who anticipate a calamity that they cannot avert, consoled herself as best she might, in the hope that at the last moment something would occur to save her, and throw herself with her daughter into the post-chaise which carried them off.